Heute bei Weltwach Eric Adams, der Sänger der legendären amerikanischen Heavy-Metal-Band Manowar. Mit ihm spreche ich über seine lebenslange Leidenschaft für Outdoor, Abenteuer und fürs Jagen. Vielen Dank fürs Zuhören und willkommen beim Weltwach-Podcast. Legendäre Grenzgänger und leidenschaftliche Weltenwanderer nehmen uns mit auf ihre Streifzüge und bieten Einblicke in ferne Orte und faszinierende Kulturen. Mit offenen Augen ins Abenteuer. Das ist der Weltwach-Podcast mit Erik Lorenz. To me, when I'm in the woods, it's the most relaxing time because it's the only time I'm really quiet. I play in the loudest band in the world. And any time I can get away and just in my own private thoughts, that's the way to go. I, I love it. I like to watch the animals wake up around me and they don't know I'm there because I'm I've already been there an hour sitting waiting for everything to happen. There's so much going all around you that it, you take it all in and you say, oh, this is this is what life is all about. Some people think that hunters just go out there, they shoot everything they see and they leave it just because they want to kill something, you know. That's that's just not true. Hallo und herzlich willkommen zu dieser Weltwachfolge. Mein Gast heute ist der Frontmann einer Band, die mich, und das wird einige von euch vielleicht überraschen, seit meiner frühen Jugend begleitet wie keine andere. Und das ist die Heavy-Metal-Band Manowar. Ja, das ist genau die Musik, die ich gern höre. Iron Maiden, Alice Cooper, ACDC, die ganzen alten Garden- und Oldschool-Helden und auch ein paar neuere Bands, die in ihre Fußstapfen treten. Und eben auch Manowar, die Kings of Metal. Seit ihrer Gründung 1980 haben sie etliche goldene Schallplatten erhalten. Sie haben in ihren Alben mit Legenden zusammengearbeitet, wie dem Filmregisseur Orson Welles oder auch Schauspieler Christopher Lee. Der hat zum Beispiel im Herrn der Ringe den bösen Zauberer Saruman gespielt. Ja und bei ihren Konzerten, da treten sie neben E-Gitarren und Drums auch mit hundertköpfigem Orchester und Chor auf. Einer ihrer wichtigsten Erfolgsfaktoren ist zweifellos der Sänger Eric Adams. Er kann einfach alles singen von richtig hartem Stoff mit Gekreische und Gegrunze bis hin zum Phantom der Oper oder auch Puccinis Nessun Dorma, eine Arie, die bei Manowars Shows in Italien insbesondere zum Stammrepertoire gehört. Eric Adams ist aber nicht nur Sänger von Manowar, sondern er verbringt auch sehr viel Zeit in der Wildnis, vor allem in der nordamerikanischen, denn er ist leidenschaftlicher Jäger und auch Jagdsicherheitstrainer im Staat New York. Genau darum geht es im folgenden Interview, das wir in Englisch geführt haben, um Erics Liebe zur Natur und seine Leidenschaft für die Jagd. Das ist natürlich ein kontroverses Thema, das ist mir bewusst. Jäger sind für manche nichts anderes als schießwütige Monster, die tötend durch den Wald marschieren. Aber ich denke, es ist immer wünschenswert, die eigene Auffassung von anderen Sichtweisen zumindest mal herausfordern zu lassen oder sich diesen Sichtweisen wenigstens zu stellen, ein offenes Ohr zu schenken. Ja, und dann justiert sich die eigene Position vielleicht ein wenig oder eben auch nicht. Ich finde jedenfalls, dass es ein interessantes und aufschlussreiches Gespräch geworden ist. Ja, und ganz abgesehen von allen inhaltlichen Punkten war es für mich persönlich ein riesiges Erlebnis, eine der größten Ikonen in der Geschichte des Rock und Heavy Metal zu treffen. Viel Spaß bei unserem Gespräch. Hi Eric, welcome to our podcast Weltwach. It's great to have you. Well, it's good to be here. Believe me, it is. Anytime anybody wants to talk to me about the outdoors and hunting, I'm here for you. I really am. I love it. That is very good to hear. So let's do it. But before we go into the topic of outdoors and hunting, right. let me ask you, how is the tour with Manuel going? So far, it's been ex excellent. It's been excellent. It's been grueling. It's been very hard for us, but uh, it's been excellent. I mean, we've taken this tour all the way across to... Uh, The furthest point of Russia and Vladivostok, um, and toured all of Russia, almost a month in Russia, as a matter of fact. And then we're uh, uh, now we're in uh, Germany, and uh, after Germany, we head uh, up the north, up to Norway and yeah. Scandinavia area. And on April 16th, I'm going to be up in the Arctic Circle. I'm looking forward to that. Have you ever been there before? Not, I mean, it's way away up there. It's like 400 miles away from the North Pole. That's that's way up there. Oh. So that's kind of cool. You know, Will you have been... any time up there to do any kind of sightseeing or traveling? Well, I'm hoping uh, the place we're playing, there's a law in the, in the city saying that if you leave, if you're walking the streets, you have to have someone carrying a rifle because of so many polar bears. The polar bears are three, uh, three times the amount of people that are there. Wow. 
And it's, you know, it can be pretty bad. And with global warming, the polar bears are heading down south, 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 and they're further into close to the cities now. It's a little it's a little You almost hope to see some, of course. I do. I really hope to see a polar bear chasing somebody else. <laughs> I'd love to see that. <laughs> As long as so, I'm not involved in it. <laughs> so this tour that you are just in the middle of, it mm -hmm. was, as far as I know, supposed to be your uh, farewell tour. Last yeah. year, you guys announced the end of your career, sadly. Yeah. However, in a recent interview, your band leader, Joey, yeah. he hinted at that it might not be quite the end after all. Yeah, so I mean, we've what got is the retirement status? Well, <laughs> I'm ready to retire, but, you, you know, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here for the band. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm here for as long as it is and uh you know the fans really wanted us to come back they don't want us to leave right now we really you know we ex fully expected to you know finish this as a matter of fact when we had a band meeting uh you know we mentioned that you know this is a retirement tour and this is a final tour and i said is this our first final tour you know <laughs> we joked around a little bit about it like many people many like the bands. scorpions and so on they are yeah, on yeah. the final farewell tour forever yeah and now but i understand why now because the fans don't want you to go yeah. they just don't want they want you to come and and play more and so i guess we're scheduling already things for march of next year and you know <laughs> there's a rock opera that joey's writing now that uh, he announced last night and you just uh, released an ep a new cd just yesterday just yesterday yeah just also yesterday. kind of a surprise for a band that wants to you know take it slow yeah yeah yeah, yeah. well you know what i personally i i I don't mind personally. I don't mind being in the studio at all. Um, it's the grueling on the road. It's really bad. It's really it, it's tiring. It's tiring, and it's rough being away. And it's you know it's hunting season back home, and I'm here. You know, my friends are telling me, "Oh, it's great. Turkey season is <laughs> incredible." You know, so yeah, you know, I, I, there are times when I wish I was playing, and then there are times when I wish I was home. Hunting. So in some shape or form, of course, you will take it a little bit easier in the next years. You will have more time to be at home. How does it feel for you after all these years to see the project of Manowar coming to an end, more or less slowly? Uh, it's bittersweet. I'll be honest with you. It's bittersweet because I, I'm going to miss when it finally does end. And I don't know when that's going to be. But when it finally does end, I will miss the stage. I will miss the fans. I will not miss the music business part of it mm -hmm. but i will miss the stage i'll miss the fans and and uh you know in that sense yeah that, that's kind of rough but on the other side of it you know you can't play forever you just can't play forever and all good things have to come to an end and but i'm hey you know when i'm on that stage i don't get tired yes. I, i just you don't, don't get tired, tired. i just want to keep playing and keep playing and like the show we played in bulgaria we played for five and a half hours one night on stage we just kept playing it's like the playing. record for the longest rock or heavy metal show ever yeah right? it yeah. really was yeah. i mean and it, it was funny because we were in the dressing room after the show was over and the crowd didn't want us to leave and joey popped him in the dressing room she want to go back out i says okay let's do it <laughs> and we just stayed out on the stage and he'd announce you you guys know this song remember the song play it okay and it was it was fun it was great Really good. So let's look a little bit back, but not only with regard to Manowar, but also with regard to your own biography mm -hmm. and especially with regard to your passion to the outdoors. Yeah, yeah. When and how have you been, for the very first time, introduced to the wild? My dad, and it's imprinted in my brain, but my dad took me hunting with him one time on his shoulders. He carried me on his shoulders into the woods, and I still can smell the woods you know i smell the the leaves i can still smell that it's a vivid memory and we walked in the woods and he set me down along a, a next to a blowdown tree a big blowdown tree that was there and we sat there and he's telling me you gotta be quiet guy i was okay dad okay dad and i don't know how old i was i was very young very for him to carry me in the woods i was very young but uh, i remember seeing the first deer And I, I hollered, there's a deer, there's a deer, you know. <laughs> the deer took off running, of course. And my father, the king that he was, he, he, he just laughed and shook his head and said, well, there we go. Okay, hunt's over. Let's go home, you know. And he took me home. But that was my first experience 
in in the woods with him and I it, it just was indelible in my brain it was it's there so your first outdoor experience was also at the same time your first hunting experience yes that was it so yeah. it also forever has belonged kind of together for you both it, of it these is. aspects it is i mean I, i love the outdoors period i mean you know even at home you know anything having to do with the outdoors i'm there i am there i don't care what it is it's uh, for example well I don't care what it is. It could be helping somebody do a job outside that he's a friend of mine. And yeah, okay, let's do it. No problem. It could be fishing. It could be um, on, on a sailboat, you know, anything like that. Uh, I live in the Finger Lakes back home in New York. I live in the Finger Lakes area and there's just lakes everywhere. If you fly over it, it looks like a hand, looks like fingers. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I go boating all the time and water skiing. I mean, uh, you know. I'm into it. I just like being outdoors. I'd rather, I mean, what's there to do indoors? You sit down indoors, you sit, shoot the shit with your wife for a while and watch TV and say, what's there to do? <laughs> you know, outdoors is just so much more to do. And it's just, I just love it. I love it. How do you feel outdoors? Like when you're in the woods, for example? Um, it's, if, to me, when I'm in the woods, it's the most relaxing time because it's the only time I'm really quiet. You know, everything's really quiet. I play in the loudest band in the world. So anytime That's I another can, record of yours. Yes. And anytime I can get away and just, you know, in my own private thoughts, that's the way to go. I, I love it. I love being up in the tree stand, sitting there. And if the deer bother me, okay, fine, I'll take it. But yeah, I'd rather just sit and enjoy nature. I like to watch the animals wake up around me. And they don't know I'm there because I've already been there an hour sitting waiting for everything to happen. So. so this is kind of what being one with nature means to you, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah to really. really be in the rhythm with the animals and maybe the sun rising, exactly. the flock lifting from the ground. There is nothing more gorgeous than seeing the, uh, you know, the fog in the woods and the sun coming up through there and the rays of the sun through the fog in the woods and then seeing an animal come walking through there. I mean, it's hard to imagine in your brain what that's like. But if you're out there in the field... You not only see it, you hear it, you hear the animal coming, you know, there's there's so much going all around you that it, you take it all in and you say, oh, this is, this is what life is all about. You know, it really is. I mean, I've had, I've had, I've been up in a tree before with my bow and arrow and my, and it's resting in my arms and I've had birds come and land on my arrow, the tip of my arrow, just land on it like they think it's a tree limb. And they just stand there, and I mean, and they are very close to me. And I'm sitting there watching them. They're looking around. They're looking right at me for a while. I don't know what I am. And I've had them land on my hat before. <laughs> I'm just sitting still. I've had squirrels on my feet, on my boots. I just sit still. I don't. So I don't. You move. are really able to be still. Oh, you have to be still. You have to be still. Yeah, and I enjoy that. I, I'm. I can honestly tell you that I had. I was in the woods scouting one time, looking for a place to hunt for, for uh, turkeys. And it was a good woods, it was a good uh, deer spot for me normally. So I went there and I sat down and I looked in a spot where I could see down in the woods a long way down a hill. And I saw a deer coming up towards me. And it wasn't deer season, you know. So I'm sitting there watching the deer came up and smelled where I was hours before. And started walking around, sniffing the ground, smelling. It was right in front of me. And then it decided, well, it's gone now. Whatever that danger was is gone. And the wind was blowing in my face at the time. So the deer didn't smell me. And deer walked right by me. And I slapped the deer in the ass with my hand. <laughs> <laughs> I, did, I slapped him in the ass just to say I could do it. <laughs> <laughs> it was great so these are the memories that stick with you right yeah exactly i mean, I mean that doesn't happen to everybody you know come on <laughs> that's great so are there any other crazy funny impressive hunting experiences that come to mind that you like to talk about <laughs> of course probably there are lots because you have been doing it for so many years there are tons there yeah. are tons. i remember one time i was hunting in between I was in a tree stand that was in between two big, huge trees. And I could see something in the early morning. I could see something coming towards me, coming towards me in the air. It was flying towards me. And, man, it was huge. And it kept flying. I'm thinking, what, what in God's name is this thing? And it kept coming closer. And it was flying low. 
so low that I I bent down in the tree stand and it went right between the trees I was flying I was in and it was a uh, it was an owl with a big huge wing, wingspan I never saw an owl that close before and here's a story here's a story your fans <laughs> would really enjoy I was in my tree stand one time hunting deer and it was um, bow and arrow season and um, I'm watching a big green field in front of me and. There's no nothing was happening. It was just a sunny day like today. It was just gorgeous. And I said, well, I'm going to enjoy the day. And I watched a hawk flying the field, just back and forth, flying the field. So I said, well, I'm not the only one out here hunting. He's hunting for food, you know, and I'm sitting there watching, and he's keeping me company, and I'm watching this hawk. And all of a sudden, the hawk goes down in the field. So I grab my binoculars, and I'm looking to see what's what's got this hawk interested. And I could see... The hawk has some kind of an animal in its in its claws, and it picks up the animal and flies right towards me. And it was a mouse; it was a field mouse. <laughs> and this this bird, this hawk, flew. I mean, from me to you away, right by me in the tree stand. And I'm up eighteen feet. I don't know what that is in meters, but I'm up quite a ways in the tree. This bird flew right by me with a mouse, a live mouse in its talons, and the mouse had his eyes were wide open, like, <laughs> what the hell is going on? Where am I going? <laughs> I never forgot that. Oh, that you, was funny. That felt, was really funny. You felt a bit pity? <laughs> I felt a little bad, but, you know, Mother Nature can be pretty cruel. It can be cruel, so... <laughs> you know, that's the way it goes. So this is the business of hunting, of course, you know, hunt or be the hunted one. <laughs> hunt or be the hunted one. That's right. I mean, uh, the people that don't understand hunting, they, they, they've they never seen an animal that's starved to death or they've never seen an animal that's ripped apart by another animal. And it's an awful way to, for an animal to die. I watched a deer once run by me. I didn't take I didn't take a shot at the deer because it was just a small deer. And it ran by me, and I watched a, a pack of uh, coyotes chasing this deer. And the deer ran out on a frozen lake and slid on the lake and fell down, and the coyotes just ripped it apart. And it was the saddest thing that anybody could ever witness. And, you know, I've taken deer before with an arrow. Um, that You know, the arrow goes right through the deer, and the deer doesn't even know it's having a bad day yet. You know, because it doesn't even know, it doesn't feel any, any pain. It's like a, it's like when you cut yourself shaving. If it's, if you're using razor sharp broadheads, it's the most humane way to take an animal when they don't even know they're hit, you know, and they're standing there bleeding and they don't know what's going on. And then all of a sudden they start to get dizzy from the loss of blood and then they drop and then they expire. To me, that's the most humane way to take an animal, you know. So, yeah, let's talk a bit, because you mentioned some people don't understand the way, yeah. you know, of uh, how hunting works and yeah. what's the, yeah. the the idea behind hunting, even yeah. in the wilderness, but also like as a sport or uh -huh. as a activity. Mm -hmm. So I am not a hunter myself, right. though I have participated in a hunt once, and mm -hmm. it was in Australia mm -hmm. on a farm, a big farm full of eucalyptus forests and beautiful bushlands. And we, in fact, we hunted for kangaroos, which oh. sounds a little, little bit like a cliche. Yeah. But of course, it was like a big sheep farm and the kangaroos, they are so numerous mm -hmm. that they damage the fences and they eat away all the grass that is so urgently needed. Right. So I didn't pull the trigger myself, but I accompanied the farmer and he took the shot and we collected the animals and processed them and skinned mm -hmm. them and all this kind of stuff. Right. So this is the humble extent of my hunting experience. Yeah. yeah. That's about it. Yeah. So I'm really interested in finding out more about it. So yeah. what is yeah. it that you love most about hunting? Um, I think knowing the conservation laws and knowing how many animals are – the conservation laws are there for a reason. They, um, At least in where I'm from – They, um, and I'm sure it's like this worldwide, but where I'm from, uh, when there's so many deer in a certain amount of square miles, there's so many deer, there's not enough food for all those deer. And then you have to, then they make the decision, say, we need the hunters to get out there and take X amount of deer out of the area, or they're all going to be suffering. And what I mean by suffering, I don't mean, I don't just mean starvation. I also mean, um, um, there's a, Territory fights. Uh. Well, there's a CWD, it's called, and it's a, a chronic wasting disease. And some deer get this. And if one deer gets it, others can get it. 
and it's it can be an epidemic and it gets to be an epidemic when there's too many deer in the area and it's it's a real bad thing it, it's a it's a real bad thing and i think a lot of the conception that that europeans have because i had this when i put my dvd out there a hunting dvd that you did some years ago yeah i put it some years ago we uh, i was down in texas i was down in colorado i went all over the united states hunting and we filmed it and uh, i explained about the animal Uh, and, you know, where the animal came from, what country it came from originally, and how it got to the United States. And I really tell the history of the animal and why we took that animal, you know. And some people think that hunters just go out there, they shoot everything they see, and they leave it just because they want to kill something, you know. It's, that's just not true. That's just not true. I'm sure there are bad apples out there in any sport and or in any activity you do. Yeah, there's bad apples out there. I'm not saying there aren't. But for the majority of hunters follow the rules and regulations, and they take what they're allowed to take. And like me, they let the small animals go to, to grow and, and become adult animals that could repopulate the area with their genes. You know what I'm saying? It's... um For example, if I'm out hunting, I don't shoot at a, anything other than an eight-point buck, which means four points on each side, at least. If it's less than that, I'm not even pulling the trigger. I'm not shooting with the bow. I'm letting it walk. I always let the small small deer walk. Um, I am very, I'm, I'm, I'm very aware of you know my area that I hunt and um, what I need to clear out of there. Yeah. So what else constitutes responsible hunting for you? Um, I think just um, not taking an animal for the sake of just taking an animal and um, taking an animal out of the field and then getting, you know, a small amount of meat for it, you know, or not eating the meat for it. That is just, that's the worst, yeah. you know. Um, if you decide you don't like venison or whatever animal you're out there hunting, then give it to somebody. In, in America... We have programs in America f to feed the hungry, and hunters can donate their um, game animals. They bring them right to butchers that are licensed to clean those animals and keep it clean and donate it to food pantries and things like that. And I've done that before, especially when I hunt down in Texas. I'm not going to – I hunted a buffalo down in Texas once with my bow and arrow, and the only reason I took that buffalo is because the – The rancher asked me to try to take him out of the field. He was a menace to the other animals that were there, and he wanted that animal gone. So I said, okay, I'll do that. But I'm not just going to take the animal and leave him for your benefit. You know, I told him that. I'll take the animal, we'll process the animal, and I'll donate the food. And that's exactly what I did. I can't bring home... 800 pounds of meat on a plane. <laughs> I can't do that. <laughs> that would uh, raise some questions at least. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I can't do it. Yeah. Um, and, and wild boar, same thing with the wild boar. There's just, you know, the, the wild pigs down there, there's just too many of them and they're too dangerous. And they will kill somebody. They will attack. And uh, I'll tell you, you find out where every nerve of your body is if you're out there with a stick and a string and something that can kill you is chasing you. That's That could be pretty hairy. Did that you experience be, that? I did once. What, once. what happened? So with stick and string, of course, you mean your bow and arrow? Bow and arrow. That was um, the only weapon? Yes, it was. And the problem is uh, with a wild pig, but you know, they take their tusks. I don't know if how much you can put this in your podcast, but they take their tusk and their objective is to hit your legs and then rip up. Yeah. So you bleed out and very quickly. Yeah. I had one chasing me once, and the problem was unless you have a quartering away shot, unless the animal is quartering away from you, you cannot put an arrow through one of those one of those animals because they have a shield from fighting other uh, like wild really boar. really thick leather skin in the and front. It's, and it's yeah. so thick and heavy that an arrow will not penetrate it. So I know this from studying all about the animal itself. So I knew that the only clean way to take that animal, humane way to take it, where it would expire quickly, is on a quartering away shot. Well, this one wasn't allowing me to do that. It was, it was coming towards me. Yeah. 
So my only option was to get the heck out of there. You know, that was all the be the faster one. I had to be the faster one. So I, I just dropped my bow immediately and just jumped up into a tree and grabbed the branch and lifted my legs and <laughs> think ran right by. And you know, it it doesn't stick around, thank God, but it, it just kept running. You know. So you also said there are some bad apples from time to time. How yeah. do you react on headlines of rich people going to Africa and I killing rhinos and I lions and I elephants? I hate it. I, it really bothers me because it gives a bad name for all hunters all over the world. I mean, to go out there and just say, I, I killed this zebra and there's the zebra's head up on the wall. What for? What was the reason? Are you eating it? No, you're not going to eat that. You're going to leave it for the other animals to eat and, you know... I don't know. You're going to find people that say, people that are going to say, well, you know, the other animals need to eat too, you know? Yeah, that's kind of true, but did that animal have to die? Mother Nature has their way of taking care of other animals. And unless I have a reputation of telling people, I teach the bull course and I teach the gun course back in where I'm from. And I tell all my students, I say, look, if you're not going to eat it, don't kill it. Hunting doesn't mean that you're actually going to kill something, okay? Hunting means that you have the opportunity to kill something. That's the hunt. The hunt is over when you pull your bowstring back and the animal has no idea you're there. That's the hunt. No. It's over. If you pull the trigger and take that animal, that's a whole different game now. Now it's, now it's the time to harvest that animal, clean it, skin it, clean it, take it home, and... Either give it to people or eat it yourself. It's a whole different thing. But the hunt is over. If you have a full draw on that deer or animal you're hunting and he doesn't know you're there, that's what the hunt is. I don't care. People go out there and hunt with a camera, you know, and it's fine. That's okay with me. That's hunting, yeah. you know. Um, I, I like the taste of venison. My family likes venison. Um, I like the taste of wild boar. So does my family. Buffalo, they loved it, okay? But uh, ducks, geese, we don't like it, so I don't hunt it. I go out there with my camera and I film my friends hunting, but I won't pull the trigger on an animal that I'm not planning on eating. I'm not going to do it. So in a sense, you know, when I'm out in the field and I'm hunting, unless that animal is about to attack me, I let it go. I let it go. You just said that you are a bow instructor because yeah. you are very skilled with a bow yourself. Yeah. And you're also an instructor for hunting safety in yeah. the state of New York. Right. You teach all the hunting safety rules and regulations right. that apply there and that allow hunters to go out in the field. Right. How did it come about that you are an instructor for that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, Eric, I'll Too tell you. Too much free time besides gonna, the touring? Or? No, I'm going to tell you the story. I, I've hunted my whole life and, um, When my kids wanted to hunt, my youngest kid wanted to hunt, so I took them, I looked all around for a place you had to have a certificate saying that you took this course before you can get a license, okay, to hunt. So as soon as I saw something in the newspaper or advertised, the day it was advertised, I would call to get my son in the course full. The course is full. And they were always full. And I finally found one course, and it was almost a full day's drive from my house. And it was a two-day course, so that meant we had to have a hotel and everything else. And I, I went there with my son, and during one of the many breaks that they take, I asked the instructor. I said, I was upset. I said, this is this is bullshit. I said, come on. I said, I got to dri drive all this way for a course that should be offered everywhere in New York State. Every time, they're always full. They're full every time. And the guy says, you're right. They fill up the day we, we, we put them out. They fill right up. I said, well, why is that? That's crap. You know? And he says, you're right. It's awful. You want to be an instructor? Because <laughs> he's part of the solution. He said, we don't have a lot of instructors. That's the problem. You want to be an instructor? And I looked at him and I said, yeah, I'll be an instructor. That's good. <laughs> so that's what started it. And it's a hell of a process. You have to. You have to sign up this application first, and then you have to take a course, an instruction, an instructor course from other instructors, from a master instructor. He teaches you how to teach the class, how to ask questions, how to 
go about teaching the class, all the paperwork that's involved, the tests that you have to give, the whole nine yards. Then when you're done with all that, which is a week of work there alone, then when you're done with that, you have to also have a conservation officer, which is a policeman, come to your house, have a sit down with you and talk, ask you where, how long you've hunted, you know, why do you want to be an instructor? Uh, what are your, what are your feelings about this and that and asking you questions? Where are you going to teach the course? The, the whole thing. And then he has to approve your name to be approved by New York State and uh, Washington DC to make sure you're not a, wanted by the law anywhere, you know, before you can get a license to teach the course. That was a big, long process. And I've been teaching this course now for over 25 years. Yeah. What do you like about it? I, well, I like, I like the fact that, that I teach kids from 12 years old to 70 years old. And, um, I like the fact that they're, they ask questions and they learn as they go. They think they, especially the gun hunters, the gun hunters think they know everything. So I ask them specifically, where would you place your shot if you hit an arrow? Where was the best place to play? And they say, oh, I shoot him here in the neck, you know, like a gun. No, that's not good. That's not going to kill that animal. I, and I explained to him what is the best way to hunt these animals. And it's different than gun season. You play games with these animals. You play with their scent. You, you, there's different things you can do. You have to play the wind, you know, and there's different ways you can do that. One way I explained to people is um, if you're hunting with two people, And um, you're hunting a small woodlot. You put one person at the end of the woodlot, and then you both, b before he sits there at the end of the woodlot, you walk up on the side of the woods talking on radios to each other while you're doing it. You get to the end of the woods and then walk all the way back. And on the way back, you spray cologne or some kind of cheap spray of, you know, cologne or gasoline or whatever you want. Just spray anything you want along the trees. So the animals can smell that. And they heard the voices there. They're not going that way. And then you walk through the woods, zigzagging through the woods, and the only way the animal will go is out towards your buddy. That's the only way. And they and they say, oh, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Gun hunters never do anything like that, <laughs> you know? And sometimes you get the animal. Most times you don't with a bow but you still have the hunt and the experience of a deer coming sneaking through and there it is oh there it is oh man oh it's exciting and then boom took off running and you missed the shot so what so what you missed did you have fun that's what it's about that's what it's all about having fun you know what are for you the best moments you've had with your students um well that's hard to say I think the best moments are after after they've taken the course from me. Um, they already have my phone number. They have my contact information, and they send me photos of the deer that they got that year. To me, that that's an answer to yeah, okay, we taught the course, we did a good job, and the fact that I didn't read in the paper that they were injured. Yes, you know, yeah, because safety is safety an is important first, part that's of the, your teaching as well. That's the most important part is safety. You know, with a bow particularly with a gun, you know, to keep the muzzle control pointed in an area where no one's going to get injured. And you have to know the safety of tree stand hunting with a bow and arrow. That's a sharp thing on the end of that arrow, and yep. it can cause a lot of damage quickly. So, yeah, I teach safety first. We teach uh, ethics. Hunting a, ethics. A big yeah. hunting ethics is in there. And I, and I tell the people, look, I says, I ask them what ethics means to them. And I ask the kids, what's ethics mean? And they say, well, you know, that means, you know, doing, doing the right thing. I said, that's right. That's part of the answer. That's correct. But in the woods, it's doing the right thing when nobody can see you. And that's the difference. And then you say to yourself, well, should I shoot that deer? It's on posted property. It's a big deer. Should I take that shot? Here, here's where your ethics comes in. If you don't have, don't have permission to hunt that man's land, but you can see the deer and it's an easy shot, do you take it or do you let it walk? And that's the question you got to ask yourself. Kind of a character test. Exactly. Exactly. And, and, you know, perfect example of this, Eric, was last year or two years ago, excuse me, two years ago, I was in the woods getting ready to do a tour with Man of War. 
told my wife, I'm going to go out and do a little hunting first. I went out there. I didn't have a lot of time to hunt. And I had an eight-point buck come walking through. And I said, I'm taking him. You know, and I pulled back the bow. And he gave me a great shot. I shot, took him right away. And it was a nice, humane, easy, you know, harvest. So I took that animal, got it all cleaned up, butchered it, and ready to go in the freezer and ready to go. And then I still had uh, two days to hunt. So I said, told my wife, I said, hope you don't mind. I said, but I've got, I got bow tags for does. I could take a doe. I only want one doe and that's all I'm going to take. She said, go ahead and go, you know. So I went out hunting and that evening I had two of the biggest bucks I've ever had in my life right next to me, right next to me. Uh, bucks, it's like the female pig? No, no, bucks are uh, a male deer. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. But I mean, the huge antlers huge and i just got through taking a small eight point buck because i was in a hurry and i didn't have a buck tag okay. to shoot the buck all i had were doe tags and this buck was almost begging me to shoot and i pulled my bull back and i looked at that deer and i'm thinking oh man you you would be mine and any other day you would be mine And he was standing there, broadside, had no idea I was there. And that, Eric, was the hunt. I was so excited just to even see that, to be able to say, oh, he was an easy shot. He'd have been mine. Just to say that, that was that was the hunt, you know, for me. And when I came back, I told my friends about it. Oh, you should have taken him for granted a lot. I got a tag. I got, that's not, what's, what's so great about that when you take an animal like that and you know in your heart that, Come on, it wasn't really yours. You did it illegally or whatever. That's not, to me, that's not uh, the essence of it. No, it just takes it away from the whole the whole feeling of a great hunt. You know what I mean? And to me, it's not worth it. What is the most common criticism that you as a hunter are confronted with that you feel is unjustified? I have, well, you got good questions here, Eric. Very good. <laughs> um, I've had uh, non-hunters people that don't understand hunting in any way and they just want to know why I can go out there and shoot that innocent animal. What did that animal ever do to you? How can you do it? I've had people screaming at me about it. How can you kill, shoot an arrow into that poor defenseless little animal? What did he do to you? And, you know, <laughs> and the best answer I could give you is what my friend told me when it happened to him because it happens to most hunters at some point in their life. My friend had an argument with a woman who was screaming at him at the top of her lungs, saying the exact same thing I just told you. How can you kill that poor animal? You're sick. What's the matter with you? That kind of thing. And he looked right at her and says, ma'am, you don't understand. He says, I've been married for 40 years. I need to kill something. That's what, that's what he said. That's what he said. Okay, there you have it. Okay. That's hard to reply to mm -hmm. in a funny way mm -hmm. before this lady. Okay. But do you also ever try to have like a real argument if you're, no, uh, if no, you're facing like a non-hunter no, or an anti-hunter? It's a waste of time. It's a waste of time arguing with them. Um What I try to do is, I mean, I, I tell my students this too. If you run into an anti-hunter, and you will, don't argue with them. Don't but, argue with them. Take your phone out. But why not try to have a discussion with them? Like today you are talking to me and I told you before yeah. we started the interview that yeah. some of my listeners might not fancy the activity of hunting too much. Right. But that it is a good opportunity maybe to yep. show your thinking behind yes. it and to show your responsible way of acting yes. with regard to hunting. And I do. Yes, I believe I do you. But why, that. but why do you not feel the inner urge to also have this conversation with other people? Well, I have had conversations with other people. Mm -hmm. All right. And they say, how can you kill an animal? What's the matter with you? And blah, 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 blah. And I it's say, too well, extreme for you too, I really. said, it's, it's, I eat the animal. That's why, because I eat the animal. And they say, you don't need to do that. You can go to the grocery store and buy that. I said, yeah, you're right, but you can't go to the grocery store and buy venison from a field. Yeah. You know, you buy processed animals. Then I don't want to eat processed animals. I just want, this is something that I, I wanted to bring home and eat with my family. And then I tell them, I said, You don't mind killing animals? And they say, I don't kill animals to survive. I say, you don't? No, I don't, they say. I said, so the cotton underwear you're wearing right now didn't kill any animals? They say, no, no. 
I said, well, how about the plow that runs through the field that rips apart animals while they're going through the field to plant cotton for your cotton underwear? And they rip worms and they rip little rabbits apart and they rip this and that. That's okay for you? But a deer with the big brown eyes, they're, they're not okay. Where, does, where do you draw the line? Hmm. You know, and then they say, well, that's not real. I mean, that's, that's, so, you know, they're just insects and they're just animals, small ant. They're still animals. They're still living beings that you ripped apart just so you can wear clean underwear. <laughs> I mean, think about it. You know, everything you do, the salad you're eating, you're not eating meat, but you killed something to have that. There's no argument. And yeah. then they look at you, you're an idiot. You're crazy. Okay. I'm crazy. I'll, uh, that's fine. It's Leave fine. me alone then because I'm crazy. With a firearm, be careful. <laughs> you know. <laughs> But I think the argument is also really good that you just made. It's natural meat. It's harvested in a responsible manner. Exactly. Much more responsible than, you know, all these massive cow farms that you see somewhere in America or whatever exactly. where they don't really have a really good life. Exactly. So, exactly. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, it's, it's, uh, I don't like to hunt if it's not a, if it's not a fair game. You know, here's another thing with me. I mean, if I if I have a shot and I miss, I don't take the second shot. Even if the animal's standing there, like, what the hell was that? You know, what was it? I don't take another shot. Why not? Because I think that I blew it. You know, that's part of the hunt for me as an individual. I practice hard. You know, I shoot. My wife can't stand it because I'm in the yard shooting every night almost. And and if I misjudge the distance of that animal and I miss it. That animal deserves to live another day. I just blew it, you know, and that's okay. That's, he won. That's part of the hunt, you know, and I don't know. I mean, I just, I like that. I really do. So for the last part of the interview, I would yeah. like to get back to Manoa a little bit, if that's fine with sure. you. I think we sure. still have a few minutes left. Sure. So yeah, you obviously had a pretty long and successful career with mm -hmm. Manoa mm -hmm. and all things have to come to an end at some point. Right. You already said that. But also you guys, you don't yet really look that weak and wrinkled and old. <laughs> so why did you feel that this is like a good time to call it a day or almost call it a day? Why now and not five years ago or five years in the future? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, um, I, I don't know what it is. It's, uh, almost, uh, almost compared to a sickness that you have to play, you have to perform, uh, you know, my whole life. I made my first record when I was 12 years old. You know, I played in my first band when I was 10 years old. I was a little kid. Yeah. And I've been playing it's ever like since. like the Kids, right? It was called? Is that true? Yeah, well, it, it turned into a band called The Kids, okay. but it wasn't that when we first started. And, and uh, you know, so I played many, many, many years on stage. Many, many years on stage. And, and I don't get tired of the stage life. I get tired of the travel. And, you know, being away from home and being away from my kid's birthday and, you know, that kind of thing. It's time for me to just, um, you know, when, when retirement was a, was brought up, I thought, you know what? That's Doesn't not the worst thing. Huh? That's not the worst thing in the world. You know, we, we've, we've made, I don't know how many albums are out there now. 12 we, or 13 or something yeah, like that. Yeah, 12 or 13 studio albums. There's 150 albums that aren't studio albums out there that people have recorded. But, you know, there's just, I've left, I left a mark. We've all left a mark in this world and, um, it'll be around. When I'm dead and gone. And when do you call it an end? When, when they don't want you there anymore or when they want you there? You know, and right now they want us there. So it's, it's, for me, it's a good time to say, and it's been fun, everyone. And thank you for, for being there for me and giving me the opportunity to, to remember all these great times, you know. If you think like 20 years in the future and you're sitting on your veranda with a <laughs> cold beer and you look into the sunset, <laughs> not singing anymore, but still kind of feeling the mark that you've made. Yeah. What would the mark look like in order for you to feel really pleased about it? I think, I think the mark is, is what the fans have already told me that, you know, here's a singer who can, and I'm not saying this because I don't have a big head. Okay. But here's a singer who can, who can sing raunchy when the song, when the character in the song demands it. Here's a singer who can sing pretty when the character in the song demands it. And um, to me, to be able to do both and to be able to to have a, a certain quality in my voice that when I say sing something, people know it's me just from hearing it. That's something that not all, not all singers can say, you know. And to me, that um, that's my mark. 
That's my I think that's the mark of Manowar, the versatility yeah. from Nessun Dorma yeah, right. and classical stuff right. to really hard stuff. And yeah. also like on the EP that was just released yesterday, like yeah. for example, Swords in the Highlands. Yeah, it's a great it's song. A, it's a very, very beautiful song and you, you show your versatility in it. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot. So let's stick with the veranda scene for a second. Okay. So when you sit there and you remember all these years, what what will you think of? Like... Um, We discussed the mark and what makes you yeah. potentially special. What will you remember most fondly? Um, that's another great question, Eric. I think I'll remember most the fans. That's what I'm going to remember most. I'll forget about the business. I'll forget about the, the garbage and the crap that goes on, you know, throughout the day. And then when the show happens, the fans make it worth all the while, make it all worthwhile. They really do because. They show their love for you. You know what I mean? They're singing the songs with you. They're, um, Is they're that just still showing something? you their love. You know, that when I'm doing Swords in the Wind tonight, you're going to see fans in the front row with tears in their eyes. Swords because, in the Wind, that's the song title, yeah. Yeah, because it's just, it, I, it's a pretty song. And it's a song about a guy who's dying or, or who's ready to go to Valhalla. And, and, you know, and the tears start coming. If I could make their feeling so their hair and their arms are sticking up. Goosebumps. <sighs> You know, then I've done my job. Is it and, still personal to the, you to to see these reactions yeah, after all these years? Absolutely, it is. I mean, that's what I'm going to remember when I'm on that veranda with the beer, an ice ice cold beer, and I say, "I wish this was a German beer." But what can you do? <laughs> 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 but anyway, that's. I mean, yeah, that's a, sitting up next to the pool with ice cold beer and maybe a cigar in my hand. That's all right. At the end of the day. Is there any specific event that you will remember, like a specific tour or show or album or collaboration? I mean, you worked with Christopher mm. Lee and Orson Welles and many people. Um, I don't have one specific time that I really remember more than any the other. Um, there have been there have been many times when you know we do something like ride our motorcycles through through Germany one time, um, riding the motorcycles on the autobahn. Yeah. Um, that was, that was outstanding in February, oh, by the way. Whoa, that's tough. Yeah. And, um, I, you know, just a lot of good times, just a lot of good times and bad times, but that's what makes a band stay together. You know, when you live through it together, then, you know, there's good times, there's bad times, like any other marriage, you yes. know, that's what it is. It's all part of, yeah, the history of Manowar. Yeah, exactly, exactly, right. For the very, very end, if that's fine with you, I would like to do a category that we have in all of our episodes. It's hard to translate like partial phrases or half sentences, which just basically means I start a sentence. Oh, shit, I hate these things. <laughs> It's terrible, I know, I know. We'll, we will see what you come up with. It can be really short or longer, doesn't matter. And if you don't come up with anything, I just cut it. Okay. If that's fine with you. It's fine, as long <laughs> as it's not long. That's fine. <laughs> The most special, most magical place I ever hunted at was? Was in Ithaca, New York, on top of a hillside where I could see the city in the distance and uh, tall grass blowing in the breeze while I watched a nice deer heading right up towards me, and I'll never forget that. That is the most relaxing time for me, where I could see way off in the distance. Hearing the word successful, the first person who comes to mind is? My dad. Why? Um, he raised 10 kids and, well. and none of us got arrested. <laughs> so I think that's success. I think he did a good job. My mom and dad both, they did a great job. Especially us. since uh, you are supposedly, you know, a bad boy, a bad guy. You yeah, are heavy I metal. Mean, Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, but it's just, we know, we, you, you get away with certain things. We all do as we're growing up. We okay. get away with things, okay. but nobody, nobody got arrested for anything. Nobody got caught any, <laughs> you know, to get arrested. Let me put it that way. To lead an intense and rich life. Yeah. To me means to, um, means to be happy. You don't need to have a lot of money to be happy. It's like when people say, I have a house. But is it a home? And that's the difference. You know what I mean? A house is a building. A home is a family. A home is a feeling. A home is uh, comfort. And if you're happy in your home, then that's, that's what it's all about. If fate would not have made me become the singer of Manoir, I probably would have. 
Um, it's hard to imagine after four decades. No, I know exactly what the answer is. Really? But you're thinking about if you should say it. No, no. The <laughs> answer to me is if be only because I turned down the opportunity with Manu. I turned it down three different times. Oh, really? I didn't I said, know that. I'm absolutely not going to do this. I don't want to do this. I am done with music. Why did you turn it down three times? Because I had, um, I was in bands my whole life. I told you earlier yes. that I was in bands my whole life. And the last one I was in, um, our equipment got stolen. I still had to pay for the equipment, and it was all stolen. And I, th I, sa I said, this is the end. You know, okay. I put my wife and my family through enough, and this was the end. I, I'm giving this up, and I'm just going to cut meat for the rest of my life and be a, be a meat cutter for the rest of my life and be happy doing it. You know, and so that that's probably what you that's would what have I would done. have done. That's what I would have done. Like a butcher, uh, what, not a butcher. What, what a butcher is, is the, a butcher is the guy who actually kills the yeah. animal. A meat cutter is the guy who cuts it up into steaks. Okay, okay. And that's what I would have done. Really? I would have stayed yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. One of my regrets is that um, not being able to take my family with me on tour quite a bit. I, that was that's a big regret of mine. Um, for one reason or another, you know, um, we ended up raising a grandchild, you know, we're still doing that. Yeah. Um, and so my wife could never just back off and come. Yeah. Um, my kids came to Italy once to see me play at the Gods of Metal Festival. They only um, saw, saw you once? Oh, you mean like on a big no, stage? No, they've only seen me once. Oh, really? Yeah, wow, play, that's amazing. Yeah. Because you're also tour in America from yeah. time to time, but not yeah. in not in my hometown. Okay, you mm -hmm. know. Um, so, so how yeah. was that like for you? That was for outstanding them? for me. Yeah. Just to see my kids in in the pit or in the front row there, and it was that was great for me. And you know, to have a DVD of that now, that's where I sang Ness and Dorma that night, and they were there for that. And um, that's great. It was great. I would advise my 20 year old self. To never play music for a living. Really? <laughs> what is why is that? <laughs> you um, said that you are having some troubles with the music industry as such. And well, quite no, a bit it's not that. It's not that. It's just that um, it's a, it's a very hard people people look at the bells and whistles of it, but they don't see the hardship that goes along with it. At the end of the day, you know, and you really have to you really have to love music to stay with it. You have to love it because you put up with a lot and it is what it is. You know, I tell, I tell people if you love your kid and he picks up an instrument and wants to do this, you know, and he, and you love him and break his hands. <laughs> That is really brutal. <laughs> That's right. Break okay. his hands. Okay. Two more, then we're done. Yeah. If a university would ask me to give a graduation speech, yeah, I would tell the graduates. Um, I would tell the graduates to do what they love to do for a living. Do what they love to do. What, what's in your heart? Because there's a saying, and I'm sure you've heard it, that if you love what you do for work, you'll never work a day in your life. And that's the truth. I love what I do up on that stage. It's not work. It's not work to me. But for someone to come and watch me perform, I'm soaking wet after the second song, they say, Jesus, I couldn't do that. You know, that's how could he do that? That's it. But it's not work. It's a love of, it's a love that I have. When I think of the future. Yeah. Oh. It's a very open one. Yeah. When I think of the future, I get satisfied. I, I get satisfied with it. Um, because I, when I think of the future now, I think of seeing my sons going to their weddings, you know, um, watching my grandson graduate. You know, that's, these are things that are, for me, that I'm looking forward to in the future. Um, and hopefully maybe singing a song at the, at the, at the wedding. <laughs> you would do that probably. Absolutely, I would. Absolutely, I would. Sure. I wish you all the best with your future. Thanks, Eric. I hope it will be really, really good, as good as the past has been. Thanks. And thank you very much for... Many, many years of good and inspiring music that you have given me personally, but Thanks, many man. other people as well. Thanks. And I thank you for the time that you have taken today. You will head straight to a show yeah. that you're doing in Dortmund. I will yeah. watch it, of course. That's great. That's great. All right. Eric, thanks really for a nice great interview. You. It was a really good interview. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye. Take care. <laughs>